those thoughts, and we're going to try to categorize what we mean when we say radiation. So this section is called radioactivity, and we're going to talk about, firstly, the categories of radiation. So first of all, the word radiation does not mean harmful at all, okay? Lots of things can be radiation. Now, when you guys are saying radiation, toxic, harmful, don't be around it kind of stuff, what you're meaning is the type that Lewis talked about, right? Ionizing radiation, okay? So there's radiation is just a name for energy moving through space, okay? That's all, that's all that we mean, right? So when I hit the table and make a sound, right? That sound is radiation, okay? It's mechanical radiation because I'm shaking the air in the room, right? That's a form of radiation, okay? It's not the harmful kind. Now, we can use sound and make it harmful, but the point is, is that sound is not like inherently harmful, right? The light coming out of those light bulbs is a form of radiation. Not the harmful kind, though, okay? So there's like useful, Michael said it was a tool, right? We, our light bulbs are a tool for seeing things. So we can use radiation as a tool. I make sound by talking, right? You receive that sound with your ears. That's a tool, yeah. Yeah, that's so it. The sound would be waves and then the light would be particles. The light's actually a wave or too. Wave? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um so but you're on the right you're on the right track though. Radiation is energy moving through space. Now the form that that energy takes can be different, right? For example, the waves in the air, the sound waves in the air, right? What's moving between you and me? The air molecules by my mouth are not moving to your ears, right? What is moving is the energy moving through the air. Right? We vibrate the air, the air vibrates here, which vibrates the air here, and then vibrates the air here. It's the energy transferring, right? If you ever sit in the ocean in a boat or something like that and have a wave pass you by, right? When the wave passes you by, the wave doesn't necessarily take you very far with it, right? The wave passes by you, your little boat goes up and then down as the wave passes underneath you, right? The water stayed there. You in the boat in the water stays there. The energy moved through the water. Okay, the wave of energy moved through the water. So waves in a medium are one form of energy. Waves in water, sound in air, those are forms of radiation. Water waves and sound waves are the best example of waves in a medium. In order for there to be waves traveling from me to you, sound waves traveling from me to you, there has to be a medium. What's the medium between me and you? Air. Air. What's the medium in, a, in, a, in the waves in the ocean? water, right? It's the, the water is the medium, the air is the medium, the waves are the energy traveling through it, okay? Those waves are radiation. They radiate. They move away from a source equally in all directions, okay? Another type of radiation would be particulate radiation, particles. I forget who said it, maybe Abby, but someone said that we are made of atoms and those atoms are, um, can break apart, okay? And uh, radiation with enough energy can, um, can break those atoms apart. That's ionizing. But atoms can break themselves apart, okay? An, an atom, if it's unstable, right? An unstable atomic nucleus. I think we all have, let me just briefly bring this up, a rough picture of an atom, right? A nucleus with orbiting electrons. A picture of an atom. And so when we say particulate radiation, we're saying the atomic nucleus, being sometimes unstable, tends to break apart. Okay, and when it breaks apart, it will fire away little pieces of itself, pieces of the atomic nucleus. We call that those pieces particulate radiation or particles. Okay, little pieces of atoms moving at high speeds. The pieces are combinations of protons, positively charged nuclear particles, neutrons, neutrally charged nuclear particles. And what I mean by charge is electric charge, okay? And electrons, negatively charged particles from the nucleus. Now, there are no electrons just chilling in the nucleus, okay? Electrons come from the decay of a neutron. I'm not gonna really cover that right this moment. We will in a few slides. But protons, neutrons, and electrons are the three types of particles that can come out of an atomic nucleus. And in different combinations, um, they form different particles. The third category is electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetic waves. Okay, so these are double waves. They are a wave in the, this is hard to get the first time you hear it, so just 
take the words and then hang on to the words and practice remembering them and eventually it'll start to make sense. Electromagnetic waves, light is a type of that. They're a double wave. There's a wave in the electric field and a wave in the magnetic field, a double wave, okay? This is why we call them electromagnetic waves, electric wave and a magnetic wave combined, okay? A, a photon of light, a, a, a piece of light is an electromagnetic wave. So a photon of light is a particle and a wave at the same time. Okay, that's sort of a weird concept. We'll spend some time thinking about that in physics when we get back around to physics. Um, some of you have spent time thinking about that with me, but they are a wave and a particle simultaneously. Um, light, visible light that we can see, is a type of electromagnetic wave. Ultraviolet, the type that comes from the sun and causes sunburns and stuff. Infrared waves, heat waves, right? Microwaves, radio waves, TV waves, right? Those are all forms of electromagnetic waves, um, waves in the electric and magnetic field, okay? And um, that's about all I'm gonna say right now. So two-led radiation is harmful, obviously. Right? Yeah, well, so too, 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 much of too much of anything is harmful, but yeah. too much uh, ionizing radiation, right? Yeah. So you notice, and this is a category of electromagnetic waves, right? Visible light, not harmful. Sit me, under a, sit me under a fluorescent light all day long, right? Not going to hurt me, right? Sit me under a ultraviolet light all day long, and yeah, I'm going to get a sunburn. It's like hanging out in a tanning bed all day, right? So the type of electromagnetic wave matters, right? So the amount matters, but then also the energy that that wave carries. The reason why, so a visible light and an ultraviolet light are the same type of thing. They're both an electromagnetic wave, okay? You can't see ultraviolet and it can harm you. You can see visible and it cannot harm you, okay? They're the same type of thing though. What's the difference between them? Ultraviolet light carries more energy with it, okay? Ultraviolet light will put more energy into you than the visible light will, okay? For that reason, visible light just bounces off of you, reflects, is why we can see each other, right? And ultraviolet light goes into your body and stays there, puts its energy into you, okay? It's the energy that matters. So when you guys, several of you said, when we said, what is radiation? You said energy, right? That's what it is. It's energy changing forms, right? Moving through space, changing forms. Electromagnetic waves are one form of energy. Electromagnetic waves are not always harmful. Some of them are, right? What do you see, um, like if you have like a UV light? Mm -hmm. I just hope you, what, what exactly are you seeing when you turn it on? Oh, so, so the blue is what you're seeing, uh, violet light. So you know how, you, you ever had a uh, UV light? Yeah, uh, black lights are a, a kind of them, right? Get your nails done. Get your nails done with them, right? You can see the light. Well, to be clear, you can see some light coming out of there, right? You can't see the ultraviolet that it's emitting, but you can see the near ultraviolet and violet light that's being emitted. That's why it shows a blue color. So the light bulb that emits ultraviolet also emits other types, other forms like violet and near ultraviolet, which you can see. And those colors are blue or purple. So like when you get your nails done, they use a little light and it mm -hmm. dries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The so it's, it's it's curing the okay. the the stuff, the polish, whatever the enamel, whatever they put on you, it's curing it. It's, it's sort of drying it. Because my wear like these little gloves. I don't know. It's like preventing at it. school. Yeah. So I so you taught her to. So the, they wear a glove, but you're you're like tipping your, your fingers exposed. Yeah. So it's keeping your, your skin nails. from getting the yeah. ultraviolet exposure. It's why you're supposed to wear sunscreen. Right. You wear sunscreen on your hands. You wear sunscreen when you go outside, right? Um, you know, it's like when you go outside and you put a long sleeve shirt on instead of putting a tank top on, yeah. right? You're, you're not gonna get as sunburnt or sunburnt at all when you wear the long sleeve shirt, right? Same idea, okay. right? You, it's a long sleeve shirt for your hands, I guess. Yeah. I haven't seen them, so I, I'm inferring what you're talking yeah. about. Like fingerless gloves, kind of. Yeah, now they're saying like sunscreen is kind of uh, Probably the aluminum and the metals in the sunscreen are what they're complaining about. That's why they, people complain about the same reason people complain about deodorants having the aluminum in them. Um, yeah, I know, I know. Um, so yeah, I mean, you got to take the good with the bad, right? The good part of the sunscreen is it protects you from the sun. The bad part is it exposes you to heavy metals, right? Um, good part about deodorant is it keeps you from being stinky. <laughs> the bad part is it exposes you to heavy metals, right? So there's 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 give and take here. Um, all right, but these are our three categories of radiation. Of the three, we focus mostly on particles and electromagnetic waves. Those are the type, and, and of course, electromagnetic waves are the type that we actually make. X-rays are a type of electromagnetic wave, 
Okay. Okay. So the x-rays that come out of our x-ray tube are electromagnetic waves. We don't produce particulate radiation in the x-ray machine, and we don't produce, well, I mean, in, 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 we do produce some sound waves, but that's not the point. Okay. The point is that we make electromagnetic waves, x-rays, in our x-ray machine. Okay, moving on. Cover some quick definitions so you guys are fine when I go to these next few slides. Um, there's ways that we talk about atoms, okay? Um, we have numbers that associate uh, certain things about atoms, right? So if you want to tell me what type of element you're talking about, right? So we go over to the periodic table, we run over to the periodic table real quick, right? And when we're talking about hydrogen versus helium, they're going to have a different number associated with it, okay? And if you look up on the screen, it's the top thing, the atomic number listed as a capital Z. So when you see like the Z number of an, of an atom, it's telling you the atomic number. The atomic number is counting how many protons are in the nucleus of the atom. Okay? Atoms have a nucleus, a dense center, okay? And um, that dense nucleus will have a number of protons. Protons have a positive electric charge. If that bothers you, not knowing what we mean by positive charge, that's okay. Just remember that positive is the opposite of negative. Okay, you don't need to know what positive actually means right now. It's just opposite of negative. Anyway, atoms have a dense nucleus. Protons sit in the nucleus. If we know the number of protons in the nucleus, that's the atomic number. That tells you what element you're dealing with. Okay? Hydrogen has the atomic number of 1. So in the periodic table, it would be the top right number. Okay? Hydrogen has a number of 1. Helium has a number of 2. Helium has 2 protons in its nucleus. Hydrogen has one, okay? Come down to any of these other ones. I circled tungsten here. Tungsten has 74 protons in its nucleus. Tungsten has 73 more protons than hydrogen, okay? So if you can't do this, but if you took a tungsten atom and you ripped out 73 protons, it would now be a hydrogen atom, okay? Atoms are named for the number of protons that are in their nucleus, the atomic number. If an atom changes, like if a, if a hydrogen atom magically grabbed onto another proton, it would turn into helium, okay? Hydrogen only acts like hydrogen when it has one proton. You give it another proton, it's now a different thing, okay? This changing in the atomic number is called transmutation, okay? Atoms will spontaneously, now they don't spontaneously add on protons, that takes energy, but they can spontaneously throw out protons and that will decrease their atomic number. That will change the name of the atom. It will move, it will move down the periodic table um, as it loses protons, okay? And if we mag magically manage to fuse two atoms together, that's called fusion, you can actually get free energy from that if you fuse the, uh, the right kind of atoms together. For example, if you've heard of fusion energy, what they're trying to do is they're trying to fuse hydrogen atoms together to make helium, and there's leftover free energy from that fusion process. And if we can get it to work right, we can make fusion reactors and get free energy from it. So that's what, in, if you hear in the news about them achieving fusion, that's what they're doing, is trying to fuse atoms together. Anyways, that was too much. Atomic number, Z number. Counting the number of protons, the Z number, atomic number, names the atom. Hydrogen always has one proton. Atomic mass is different. Atomic mass, given with a capital A, tells you how big the atom is, okay? Atomic mass counts the total number of nucleons in the nucleus. The name for what sits in the nucleus, we call everything in there nucleons, little nuclear particles, okay? And in the nucleus, you can have protons or neutrons. Neutrons have a neutral charge. They have a zero electric charge. So neutrons don't change the way the atom behaves. An atom with more neutrons than another atom will act the same. So two atoms with the same number of protons, right? So they're, they're the same element, but one has more neutrons than the other. They will be called isotopes of each other, okay? They will act chemically the same, but one would be heavier than the other, okay? A good example, um, if you take hydrogen, and you take hydrogen by its, uh, just regular hydrogen, which is just one, the atomic number is one, um, it behaves like hydrogen, okay? There's also forms of hydrogen where you have hydrogen that is a proton and a neutron in, a nu in the nucleus together. That's two particles in the nucleus, so the atomic number would be two instead of one. 
sorry, the atomic mass would be two. Um, hydrogen with one proton by itself, and then another hydrogen atom over here with one proton, one neutron, they behave chemically exactly the same, okay? But the hydrogen with one proton, one neutron is twice as heavy. So that has two particles in the nucleus. Hydrogen can come in the forms of deuterium, which is one proton, one neutron, and also tritium, which is one proton, two neutrons. All three are uh, hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium are isotopes of the original hydrogen atom. And these atoms can exist in any, any of these three forms in nature. We can find hydrogen with just by itself, one proton. We can also find hydrogen with protons and neutrons in the nucleus, okay? They're all still hydrogen. So counting the total number of particles in the nucleus gives us the atomic mass, the weight of the atom. Neutron number is pretty straightforward. Take the atomic number and subtract from it. Sorry, take the atomic mass and subtract from it the atomic number. So you have atomic mass of two. The atomic number is one. Two minus one is one. That would tell you how many protons are in, or sorry, how many neutrons are in the actual atom. Neutron number is just the number of neutrons. All right, these next two are important. Radioactivity is the term we use to describe when an unstable atomic nucleus breaks apart, okay? Said in their terms, spontaneous emission of radiation from atoms. You can't say when an atom is going to emit a particle. That's impossible. You can, you can calculate the probability that within a certain amount of time, an atom will emit a particle. You just can never say when. It's, it's unmistakably a, a stochastic, meaning random probabilistic event, okay? You can say that it will have a probability of doing it within a certain time. You can't say that it will happen. Atoms spontaneously emit radiation. Some atoms do it more often than others. That's the rate of radioactivity. Some are highly radioactive, others are less radioactive. And, what, and the radioactivity, the spontaneous emission of radiation, radioactivity, is referred to, at, when it happens one time, it's referred to as an event, okay? Each time it happens, it's a decay event. We say the atom is decaying when it has a radioactive uh, emission, and that's one time happening, so an event. Decay events, atomic nucleus with excess energy emits a single particle, alpha or beta or gamma, to reach a more stable state. And that's the reason why. So I've said large unstable atoms will spontaneously emit parts of themselves, right? We didn't say why. They do it to try to get stable, okay? Atoms are happy when they're stable. So the smaller atoms are very happy all the time, okay? The very large atoms are less happy, they're more unstable. The more protons and neutrons you try to pack into the nucleus of an atom, the more unstable it will become and the more likely it is to be radioactive. These large atoms are, are unstable, thus radioactive, and what they'll do is they'll just start firing off little pieces of themselves to try to be less radioactive and be more stable. There's three types of particle events that you'll have to remember. Alpha, beta, and gamma radiation, gamma emissions. Alpha and beta uh, emissions are true particle emissions, where gamma radiation is an electromagnetic wave. So we're going to learn about these three right now. So up here you have an atomic nucleus, and in this picture you've, you're seeing a alpha emission. And so we haven't described what an alpha particle exactly is yet. An alpha particle is two protons hooked up to two <laughs> neutrons. Two protons, two neutrons. The mass of an alpha emission is four. It has an atomic mass of four, okay? This alpha emission has a proton number, an atomic number of two. So this atom has lost a total mass of four, has lost four pieces, right? Two of those pieces were protons, okay? So the outcome is the Z number of the atom left behind drops by two. What does that mean for the atom? Is it the same atom? No. It's different now. Where at whatever atom that was, it is now two atoms down on the periodic table. Its name has changed, okay? This is transmutation. It lost two protons, so its Z number drops by two, and it lost four total particles, so its mass dropped by four, 
Okay, so it's a new element that is has lost four pieces. So it's lighter. It's a new element and it's lighter. Okay, and then implied, of course, the neutron number is going to drop by two as well. We don't care necessarily about the neutron number because only the z number, only the atomic number, controls the behavior of the atom. Okay, the atom will act chemically the same no matter how many neutrons it has. A beta emission is different, okay? Beta emissions, so for right now, ignore protons. Protons are stable. If you take a proton and take it out of a nucleus of an atom, and you can't do this, but if you just hold it in open space like this, you could do it with magnets and stuff, and lasers, but anyways, if you take and hold a proton just out in empty space, it'll just stay a proton forever. It doesn't decay randomly, okay? However, if you take a neutron and take it out of an atom, okay, and then hold it out into open space, it will decay. A neutron outside of an atom is unstable, okay? And if you tried to pack too many neutrons into an atom, they are unstable as well, okay? So what a neutron actually is, a neutron is a neutrally charged nuclear particle, is actually a combination of a proton and an electron, okay? You know, protons have a plus one charge, electrons have a negative one charge. If you combine them, plus one, minus one, you get zero, right? Neutrons are just a combo particle. They're a proton-neutron pair, and if you take them out of an atom, they split apart, okay? In some atoms, neutrons are unstable. So in the atom as itself, it, a neutron may break apart, okay? When a neutron breaks apart, it creates two things, a proton and an electron, okay? So now in the atom where a beta emission is going to happen, a neutron, shown here where the laser pointer is, converts to a proton and then spits out an electron, okay? So neutron converts to proton-electron pair, okay? So what has happened to this atom? Well, during a beta emission, a neutron turned into a proton. So now you have, you've added one, right? You've added a proton. The atom has one more proton than it used to have. And adding a proton will move you up on the periodic table. This is transmutation upward on the periodic table. The, notice the atom didn't get heavier. It just changed its proton number, okay? A neutron converts to proton, electron pair, and for reasons that I won't get into now, the proton stays behind in the atom. The electron from that interaction, from that, from that decay, gets spit away from the atom. The electron is the thing that we're gonna call the particle, okay? That electron is a beta ray a beta particle, okay? This beta particle has a negative electric charge. It's very small, but it has a negative electric charge. In a beta emission event, the atom gains a proton, loses only the mass of an electron. So it doesn't change in mass very much. In fact, the atomic mass we can say is unchanged because electrons are so small, okay? Atomic mass didn't change and it went up on the periodic table and it lost one neutron because a neutron converted to a proton. So we have alpha emission, very big, big charged particles. It brought the atom, it changed the atom two down on the periodic table and it lost a total mass of four. Beta emission, neutron converts to proton electron pair. You add a proton then, atom moves up on the periodic table to a new, to a new it becomes a new element and fires away the electron. Electron's very small, it's not massless, but it's so small we're not counting its mass, okay? And it goes away. The electron is the, is the particle, and the alpha emission up here, that's the particle. So you have beta particle, alpha particle. Those are our two particle emissions. Gamma emissions are different, okay? Gamma emissions come from the nucleus as well, but a nucleus with only a little bit excess energy won't have enough energy to emit an alpha or beta ray, okay? So what it does is it shakes off its energy by firing off a gamma ray. For those of you who know, know about x-rays already, x-rays and gamma rays are the same thing, okay? It's just where they came from. X-rays don't come from the nucleus of an atom, gamma rays do. So if it's an emission from an atom's nucleus, it's a gamma ray. If it's an emission from an orbiting electron, we call it an X-ray. But right now, gamma rays come from the nucleus. 
Notice the gamma ray emission doesn't change the atomic number and it doesn't change the atomic mass. The atom's the same as it was before, just with less energy now. So those are our three, alpha, beta, and gamma emissions. Alpha and beta emissions are particles. Gamma emissions are a photon, a, a piece of light, okay? Massless electromagnetic wave. All three are harmful. All three are ionizing, can cause harm to living things. Okay, so let's review briefly. This alpha emission, so ignore the atom that it came from. Now let's pay attention to the particles themselves. What is an alpha particle made of? And two. good. What parts of that alpha particle are going to control its behavior? The protons, right? And why? They're, they have an electric charge, right? What do you know about electric charges and how they act near other electric charges? So two positive charges push each other away and two negative charges push each other away. What happens when you have opposite charges? There's an attractive force, right? So opposites attract like charges repel, okay? This is gonna become important because now what this atom has done is this alpha particle is a positively charged big massive thing. That's tiny, right? It's an atom size, but it's small. But for, the, for atoms, that's a big thing, okay? That, uh, by the way, the alpha emission, you will hear some people talk about the alpha emission and they'll call it a helium nucleus. Do you know why they call it a helium nucleus? Because it literally is a nucleus of helium. A, helium. a nucleus of helium is just two protons, two neutrons, okay? And so every helium atom, that's the stuff we fill balloons with, right, is a bunch of atoms with the nucleus having two protons, two neutrons. That's what an alpha emission is, okay? Alpha emissions are helium nuclei. So that is our well, no, because helium is, is, a, is a gas with electrons around it, right? So th this is just the nucleus by itself, and it's charged, right? A helium atom um, is neutral, right? Helium is happy and neutral. It doesn't interact. It's actually a noble gas. It's on the right side of the table. Um, but the alpha emission is just a nucleus of helium, and that thing is harmful by itself with no electrons around it, okay? So, okay, so the alpha particle goes firing off into space. It has a charge of plus two. The beta particle also goes firing off into space. It has a charge of minus one, okay? So they're both charged. They're both massive. Gamma rays have no charge and no mass. They're like an x-ray, okay? All three can cause harm. Let's look at how they can cause harm. This is an atom in someone's body, okay? It's a happy atom. Let's count how many electrons it had. One, two, three, four, five, six. Do you guys know what has six? Six electrons, six protons? Should be one of the ones you can call, call it from memory, huh? Carbon. carbon. Carbon has six, good. Um, so this is carbon. Um, why would we, why would this alpha particle run into some carbon? Because we've got a lot of carbon in our bodies, right? You may have heard if you look like science fiction at all, we're carbon based life forms, right? What that means is our atoms are built on the structure of carbon. Okay. Carbon's important in, in the world. It's important in our bodies. And here's a carbon atom. Okay. Now this carbon atom happened to be wrong place, wrong time. And an alpha particle went zooming past it. Okay. The alpha particle has a charge of plus two a positive charge. So that positive charge can pull on a negative charge. Well, it just so happens orbiting around the carbon atom are six negatively charged electrons. And we learned that opposite charges attract, right? So this positively charged alpha particle goes zooming by the atom and its positive charge pulls on one of the orbiting electrons. If that alpha particle is fast enough and close enough, it can rip out one of the electrons from that atom. Okay, what's that called when the electron is removed from the atom? Not transmutation, what has happened to the atom? It has been ionized, okay? The atom is now charged. If you notice, uh, igno so act like this didn't happen yet, and you'd have six electrons orbiting the atom, okay? In the nucleus, there would be six protons. This would be a happy, neutrally charged atom. Atoms are happiest 
when they're neutral, okay? They have six positive charges, six negative charges. It's happy and neutral, okay? Maybe this atom was hanging on to part of your, you know, genetic code. It was a piece, a little piece of your genetic code, right? Um, it'd be like the rails of your genetic code or something like that, your DNA, okay? Now an alpha particle comes by and rips out one of the electrons. Well, maybe that electron is what was holding that carbon atom to an oxygen atom, okay? Or holding that carbon atom to a hydrogen atom, right? And now you've ripped away one of the electrons, and now that carbon atom's bond with the, elect with the hydrogen or oxygen atom nearby will break, okay? And if that break happens in an, at an important part in your DNA, that will change your genetic code, cause a mutation in your genetic code. Now, nine out of 10 mutations in your genetic code can be repaired because your body's smart, okay? But the 10th one can't, okay? And that 10th one happens over and over and over again, so you get a cumulative effect of this, okay? Happening many times, over long periods of time, you get a cumulative effect of these mutation events happening, and you get genetic breaks, changes in the genetic code, People have congenital defects in their offspring. A number of weird things happen. You get cancers, stuff like that, right? It happens because, the alpha, in this case, the alpha particle can remove an electron from the atom, and now that atom won't act the same as it did before. It'll now maybe break a bond that it had, okay? Beta particles are similar but different. Remember, beta particles are negatively charged, and like charges repel. So where the alpha particle pulled the electron out of the uh, orbit, a beta particle would push the electron out of the orbit. Same thing though, right? Same outcome. The atom left behind is lo has lost an electron. The atom left behind has been ionized. So alpha and beta emissions can ionize nearby atoms. That's a problem. Now, alpha emissions, they do not pass through the body they travel less than one millimeter into tissue. So notice when I, I was very specific when I chose my words, I said a nearby atom can be affected, right? Because alpha particles can't travel very far, okay? Where an X-ray can pass through the entire body, like from the X-ray tube, through the air, through your body, alpha particles don't do that. If you had an alpha particle gun and I shot it at you, all of those alpha particles stay in the first millimeter of your body's tissue, okay? Similarly, if you smoke cigarettes and inhale it into your lungs, all that alpha radiation stays and emits into the inside of the lung tissue, right where the smoke is being inhaled, okay? It deposits its energy in tissue in a more concentrated, thus more harmful manner. Penetration related to biologic harm, it, it has an inverse relationship. The more penetrating a radiation is, the less harmful it is. Okay, so if a radiation does not penetrate the body, stays right at the surface of the body, that's the more harmful kind than the other than another type which would pass through the body, for example. This next slide will give you sort of an idea about that. Okay, so we have alpha, beta, gamma, and X-ray. These are the symbols used for them. These are the penetrations into tissue. Alpha particles less than one millimeter. Beta particles, less than two centimeters. Gamma rays, more penetrating than x-rays. X-rays, 2% of the x-rays pass through the body. Normally we say like 1% or something, but it doesn't matter. Some small fraction of the x-rays actually pass through the body where zero alpha particles and beta particles are gonna make it through someone's body. They're all gonna stay in the body. The harm is big for alpha and beta, where the harm is less for x-ray and gamma. The mass of an alpha particle is 8,000 times the mass of an electron because one proton is 2,000 times the mass of an electron. Protons and neutrons have the same mass and the atomic mass of an alpha particle is four. So four times 2,000, 8,000. Anyways, uh, alpha particle is worth, worth 8,000 electrons. That's how much bigger. So notice proton and electrons have equal and opposite electric charge. Proton has plus one, electrons have minus one. They have the equal charges, right? They're, they're opposite, but they're equal in like magnitude, right? But the masses are not equal. An electron is 2,000 times smaller than a proton, okay? Protons are very, very big in atomic terminology. In the atomic world, protons are very large. An alpha particle, four things, two protons, two neutrons, is huge, 
in the atomic world, okay? Alpha particle is 8,000 electrons in mass. Where beta particles have a mass of one, one electron, that's all they are is one electron. Notice gamma and x-ray, no mass. They don't have, they don't weigh anything, okay? There's consequences of that. One of those consequences is, is that alpha, oh, sorry, that, that x-ray and gamma rays always and only exclusively always only travel at the speed of light. They can't slow down, okay? Alpha and beta particles, because they're massive, always and exclusively stay below the speed of light, okay? The speed of light is something that only massless things can do, okay? Anything with mass has to stay below that speed. So these guys travel slow, but are heavy. These guys travel fast and are, are light. They don't weigh nothing. Notice the source for the first three, alpha, beta, gamma, all come from the nucleus. X-rays come from outside the nucleus. Well, what's outside the nucleus of an atom? Electrons orbiting around it, right? That's where X-rays come from, okay? So the difference between X and gamma rays is their source. X-rays come from outside the nucleus, gamma comes from inside the nucleus. Let's talk, let's clear that up maybe, okay? So your beta particles, your negatively charged beta emissions, one eight thousandth the mass of an alpha particle, but half of the charge, okay? So the more important thing in, in, in the atomic world is the electric charge. The mass doesn't count for that much. It's the electric charge that matters. It is the electric charge that keeps an alpha particle from alpha and beta particle from zooming through the body. If the alpha particles and beta particles were not charged, they could, in principle, zoom right through the body. Okay, the electric charge is what stops them. They've run into other atoms, right? Like charges repel, opposite charges attract, and you're made of lots of atoms, right? So they just run into charged things, and they're stopped because of that. X-rays with no mass and no charge are highly penetrating. Right? That's a good thing. You want them to be penetrating. You don't want them to stay into the body. Right? We talked earlier about filtration of, their, of our x-ray beam. Right? We mentioned there's some x-rays that are so low in energy that they stick around. Okay? Those x-rays, um, we don't want them. We filter them out of the x-ray beam. We don't even let them hit the patient. Either way, about a percent or two passes all the way through the body, which means 99, 98% of the x-ray beam stays in the body. Right, so that's some of it stays in the body, the majority does, right? Um, the reason why we have radiography and we can make x-rays is because some of the x-ray beam can pass through the body. Think of what would happen if none of the x-ray beam passed through the body. Could we expose an image receptor? No, right? There'd be nothing passing through the body to, to create those images, right? We have to have some of the beam able to pass through the body. This is why radiography is possible. Gamma rays, as much as 10% of gamma rays can penetrate through the body. So they're more penetrating. That in some ways means they're less harmful. However, their energies are higher. So higher energy means more harm, but also more penetrating. So you have to sort of run the numbers there. And it comes out to be that they're a little uh, less harmful directly than x-rays are because of the absorption. But at very high uh, energies, they, they're they're more harmful. So it's sort of give or take. X-rays and gamma rays kind of equal in, in, in harm. Um, we treat them very similar. Okay, let's learn some more terms. You guys are doing really great so far. Um, you guys, no, you really, really are. You're doing really great. This is a great first day because we're going to, um, I know this stuff might be complicated for you, but we're going to start to get complicated <laughs> over the next several uh, lecture sessions. So this is the take it easy day for us. <laughs> we're, all we're doing today is we're learning terms, right? We're just getting some terms on the table, sort of getting you introduced to this stuff. Um, there's a lot, though. I will grant you there. We're, we're doing a lot. I, I applaud you for sitting through all of this. So I want to I want to add on some terms. Okay. Um, recall that we name atoms. So and every atom, every element on the periodic table has a name, like a, like its name. Someone named it, right? But it has also numbers associated with it, right? We have the atomic number, the Z number. Can someone rem remind the rest of us what the Z number, the atomic number, tells us? number of protons, right? The atomic number given as a capital Z 
tells us the number of protons. What does that tell you, though? Knowing the number of protons, what do you know now? The weight of the uh, of the atom. Not the no. weight yet. That would be atomic mass. Knowing the number of protons tells you what? what it is, right? What its name is going to be. Like, we know if you have an atom that has two protons in it, it's going to be helium, okay? We know if you have an atom with eight protons in it, it's going to be oxygen. It just is, right? If you added or took away protons, it would change its name, transmutation, okay? So, um, there's atomic number. Then there's atomic mass. Atomic mass told you how many total things are in the nucleus, right? For example, you can have hydrogen with just one proton. Its atomic mass is one, still hydrogen. You can have hydrogen with one proton and two neutrons. That's tritium, okay? It's still hydrogen. Tritium is an isotope of hydrogen. And its atomic mass would be what? One proton, two neutrons? Its atomic mass would be three. It's three things there, right? It's still the same element. Okay, we say that an atom with different numbers of neutrons, but the same number of protons, two different atoms, different numbers of neutrons, same number of protons, it's the same element, but they are radioisotopes of each other. Okay, an isotope is you have an atom with a certain number of protons, a certain number of neutrons, and you have another atom with the same number of protons, so it's the same element, but a different number of neutrons. Both of those atoms will behave chemically exactly the same, okay? They are isotopes of each other. The word isotope just means an atom with different numbers of neutrons. Now, isotope means that, different numbers of neutrons. And this term is a little more specific. They say radioisotope. So what we mean is an atom with so many neutrons, extra, that it becomes unstable radioactive okay you'll get things like beta alpha or alpha beta and gamma emission so that the atom will be more stable eventually the atom will stop being so radioactive it'll decrease in its in its in its uh, radioactivity these radioisotopes I, I'm, I'm getting ahead it's almost like i've done this lecture before these different isotopes emit alpha beta and gamma in different combinations and some will do all three in different amounts, but the point is, is that they'll do all three, potentially. The term isomer used much less commonly. Isomer means you have an atom. Let's say you have got helium, right? And you have a helium atom, and then you have another helium atom over here that is the same thing with more energy in its nucleus. No, no numbers are different, just more energy. That isomer of helium will be radioactive, and it'll emit gamma rays. It'll stabilize by emitting only gamma rays. All right. So the two things, two things you have to consider here with radioactive atoms, okay? What is their decay rate? How fast, how many radioactive decay events are happening per unit of time over one second or something like that, right? And then the next thing is the half-life. The half-life is, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, but the half-life is the time required for the rate of radioactivity to decrease to half of where it started. So if an atom has um, two decay events per second, right, and its half-life is a minute, okay? So for one minute of time, that atom will emit two things every second, okay? Then once one minute has passed, that atom will now emit only one thing per second. It'll become half as radioactive. Does that make sense? That's, that's half-life, okay? If another minute passes, so we, we keep, keep, in tra keep track here, right? We had an atom, it had two decay events per second, and its half-life is one minute, all right? So for the first minute of time, we count two clicks on our Geiger counter every second, okay? After the first minute, we count one click on our Geiger counter per second, all right? After the two minutes have passed and we're onto our third minute, now we're gonna count one click every two seconds, right? We go to another minute, it'd be one click every four seconds and so on. It would decrease in its amount of radioactivity by half every minute, okay? That's the half-life. 
Okay. The example I just gave you is its half-life is a minute and its decay rate is, is two per second. Okay. We're going to look at ones that have way different half-lives than that. Okay. Um, notice those are independent things. The decay rate is its own thing and the half-life is, is its own thing. Okay. Um, so let's look at some half-lives of uh, certain isotopes. So here, here, here should help you understand what an isotope is a little better. All of these are uranium. Okay, so everyone listed here is uranium. These are all just different types of uranium. So what, are the, what does all these have in common? The proton number, right? The Z number is the same for all of these. What's different? The neutron number, right? The, oh, and, and, and consequently, the atomic mass is different, right? So this number you're seeing here, 230, right? This is telling you the total mass of the atom atomic mass 230 231 232 and so on okay so let's look at how long the half lives are for these so you have a sample of um, uranium 230 the top one whatever its radioactivity is you're holding it in your hand hopefully not right but you have it in your hand right and um, whatever its radioactivity is you can measure it okay come back in 20.8 days and whatever you measure will be half of what it was doing Okay, 20.8 days earlier, it had some radioactivity. Come back at this 20.8th day, and it's now half as radioactive. Okay, so, you know, a less than a month passes, and it's less, it's, it's half as radioactive as it was. Okay, uranium-231, it takes 4.2 days to be half as radioactive. So whatever it is, at, when you start to measure it, 4.2 days later, it's half that radioactive. Uranium-232. 70 years, whatever its radioactivity is, it will stay that way for 70 years. Come back in 70 years when you're an old person, right? And um, you will measure its radioactivity to be half of what it was 70 years before that, okay? Check out some of these other ones though. Uranium-238 is my favorite, and it has the longest half-life. 4.5 times 10 to the nine years, okay? That's, scoot that decimal point nine places to the right and add zeros, okay? It's it's the age of the Earth. It's 4.5 billion years, okay? If you had a sample of uranium-238 in your hand now, and then you traveled back in time to when the Earth got created, okay, and you were in that, you know, that magma liquid state, and you took a sample of uranium then, they would be the same in radioactivity, okay? The uranium-238 that we have today is as radioactive as it was when the Earth was created four and a half, a solar system, four and a half billion years ago, okay? So some, the point is, some um, elements have super long half-lives, like uranium-238. An isotope of uranium, though, might have completely different. Look, look at 235, its half-life is 26 minutes, right? So whatever that quantum state, whatever the makeup is of that atom, 235, causes it to have a half-life of 26 minutes, where add on only three more neutrons, and now the half-life is... 4.5 billion years, okay? Completely different, right? Depending on what, at and notice there's no like theme here. It's not like the heavier it gets, the longer its half-life is. These are sort of mismatched, right? The heaviest version, uranium 240s half-life is 14 hours, right? Where 238 up here, its half-life is the age of the solar system, okay? So they're all different, that's the point. So these are all isotopes. They're all uranium, just different kinds of uranium, okay? Chemically, these will all act the same, okay? So, you know, uranium-238 in your glossy magazine will behave the same as uranium-235 on your glossy magazine, okay? They will act the same, okay? We can tell which one it is because we know the half-lives of these. So we can measure it and we can tell with you know, precision measuring instruments, we can tell which one it is. That, by the way, is um, how they do carbon dating. You guys have probably heard of carbon dating, right? There's a certain type of carbon, I think it's called carbon-14, um, that they take and they know, they know what its radioactivity is and they know what its half-life is. So if you can measure the radioactivity of carbon-14 in some substance you pulled out of the ground, you can tell how long it's been in the ground for. Okay? Um, it's carbon dating. So if you've heard that, that's what, that's what they're doing. Um, all right, let's look at a few more. Uh, these are different elements now. So polonium-215, its half-life is 0.0018. It's roughly a thousandth of a second. Okay? So it's it's decreasing in its radioactivity very, very fast. Every thousandth of a second, it gets half as radioactive. It'll undergo 10 half-lives well before a second has passed, okay? By the way, 10 half-lives 
is when we say an, an element is not radioactive anymore, okay? Uh, you'll notice uranium-238 hasn't even under, undergone its first half-life yet, okay? It's, it's just about to its first half-life, okay? Um, others, though, they undergo all of their half-lives within less than a day, right? You know, bismuth here, bismuth-212, its half-life is 60 seconds. So wait 10 minutes, and bismuth-212 has become non-radioactive. The sample you had at the start of it is now not radioactive anymore, okay? After 10 half-lives. Sodium, 15 hours, there's sodium, right? You have sodium in your body. Sodium-24 is radioactive, 15-hour half-life. Iodine, cobalt, radium, uranium-238, these are, are different elements um, which are radioactive, and we've learned now their half-lives. Okay. Let's pause. A pizza's here. So let's pause for a minute here. Um, I'm going to bring out everything that we need. We're going to get what we need and sit back down for a little bit. Um, but hang tight for just a second here. Let me bring everything in and uh, get you guys fed. You guys earned this, so you want me to make room my hair? Uh, you know what? Uh, I'm going to clear off this real quick. Let's go right here. Do you need help? Uh, no, I'm just going to pop these pieces down. I want you guys to help yourselves to the pizza, though. <laughs> Just a second. Uh, pizzas are up here. There's cheese, pepperoni, veggie, and I think there's a couple combos too. There should be enough for everybody to have what they want. Plates, napkins, cheese, and peppers are up here. Please come help yourselves. And I'll grab the drinks and bring those in. Just jump in, Mark. So there is um, there's water in the water tower on the other side of the door, and I've got uh, several sodas here for you guys. Thank you. I don't think that will work with the x no. All right. You still got to pass your steak board. <laughs> yes, ma'am. There's a lot, lot more work to do. Wait, but, do we get like a steak dinner? If you oh, my gosh. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I like ribeye. Medium rare. <laughs> Drinks are up here. Sharpie, so you can throw your name on your cup so don't get mixed up with someone else's. As I say.